what I took away from it, I just said, you know, wow, I come from some very strong people because my ancestors survived. You know, we are still here in 2021 in the United States. So they had to be incredibly strong to make it through the castle and then make it through the boat ride and then get to the United States and make it through slavery. It made me, in a sense, feel proud because I was like, wow, okay, they really endured a lot. is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers, and learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody. It's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. My guest today is Stephanie Claytor. She is an award-winning journalist, world traveler, storyteller, and founder of the travel blog, blacktrekking.com, which focuses on Black history and culture around around the world. She is also the author of the travel memoir, Black Trekking, My Journey Living in Latin America. After spending much of her professional career as a TV news reporter in the U.S., Stephanie transitioned to becoming a mompreneur, caring for her son while focused on her travel blog and freelance writing. Her mission today is to inspire more Black Americans to travel internationally or live abroad, and she has been featured in National Geographic, Travel Noir, and Black News Channel. Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to have you here. This is going to be an awesome conversation. You're doing really, really cool stuff. But let's just start off by setting the scene about where we are recording this from today. We are not in person. I am actually in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina, on the east coast of the United States. And where are you today? I am in the Tampa Bay area in the sunshine state of Florida. I love it. That is an awesome place to be. Your weather is a lot nicer than ours at the moment. So I'm a little bit jealous, but super excited to jump into this conversation. So let's start off a little bit with your background. Can you share a little bit about where you grew up? And as you were growing up, how did your interest in travel develop? So I grew up in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. My family is African-American. And I mean, I started traveling when I was a month old. My family has a family reunion, the Clater Reynolds family reunion. We have it in a different destination every two years. I was a month old. It's on the July 4th weekend. So that was like my first trip. And then besides that, my mom planned vacations every summer around the United States, mostly the East Coast. And so, you know, every year I'm going on these vacations. I love them. And When I went to California, when we were 10, it was my first flight and I just really had a good experience there, but also was very eye-opening that the world was much bigger than Cleveland, Ohio, and I wanted to see it all. And I should say this too, I had a second grade teacher who had traveled all over the world. She took pictures of all these destinations that she went to and they were in photo albums and I was just fascinated. And so I would often ask her, Hey, let me go see your photo album. And I would just be looking at all of her pictures. And I always said, I was like, I want to do this. And I would literally go look at the pictures and then I would take encyclopedias home. Yeah, I'm that old. So I would be walking around (laughs) with a book bag of encyclopedias, reading about all these countries that she went to. So I think it was a compilation of all those things. And I should say that teacher, her name was Mrs. Carol Zenizak. When I got the Fulbright Award, she read about it in the newspaper and she wrote me this letter like congratulating me and she was so excited for me. That is amazing. So first of all, I went to college in Cleveland, Ohio. I went to John Carroll University. So shout out to the land. Much love for Cleveland (laughs) for sure. Till I die. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. No doubt. So then how did the international travel come into it, right? So your family was taking you on trips around the U.S. You found out there's a lot of diversity, even within the U.S. was very different from Ohio. And then what was your first international trip? So, yeah, I was dreaming about going to all these places, but my family did not have passports. And so that just wasn't going to happen with them. So I made it a point. I said, I'm going to study abroad. And so... My roommate was Dominican. We went to Puerto Rico. 
I met a Puerto Rican and we became good friends. We got a scholarship together. And this was like right after when I graduated from high school. And so she really exposed me to Puerto Rican culture. And I went to visit her family in Puerto Rico, but that's still a part of the United States. But I loved it so much. We went Christmas, my freshman year in college. I went back for spring break with my Dominican roommate and my cousin. Loved it so much. And so my roommate was like, well, if you really like Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic is kind of similar. You should go there. And it just so happened we opened up at Syracuse a new study abroad program to the Dominican Republic. And so I had also simultaneously been learning about Afro-Latin culture, Spanish, because I was also majoring in Spanish. And so initially I wanted to go to Cuba, but my mom didn't approve of that. And so she was okay with the Dominican Republic. And so that's how I ended up there. And that was honestly, that was my first international trip. And I was moving there. I had never met anyone on the island and I had packed up my suitcases and moved there. And that was my first international trip. Actually, I guess I'm lying because we did go to Niagara Falls, but that doesn't count. I mean, it counts, but <laughs> you, not you really. You stepped across the Canadian border and saw you were one of the maid of the mist. And uh, well, I went to high school in Buffalo, New York. So I took a number of people to Niagara Falls and you go on the maid of the mist through and you go over to the Canadian side and all yeah. of that. So yeah, not exactly the same thing as going to the DR. So I'm super excited to hear about your DR experience. I mean, one, just in terms of your personal journey, but also I too have a lot of amazing Dominican friends that I dearly love. And if you can believe this, I have never been to the DR yet. It's so high on my list. Oh my gosh. So I want to live vicariously through you and hear about the DR from your perspective and also how that really sort of shaped you and your journey. Wow. I mean, that's where I really started to learn Spanish and put that to use. We had so much fun. I was 19 years old. So you can imagine this young woman just dropped off in this foreign country. We used to party a lot. I can tell you the nightlife, the partying was fun. I love the beaches. And we went to school. <laughs> um, I, had, I went to college there during the day. I shouldn't say it didn't teach me much, but I learned a lot of lessons in the streets of DR. What were some of the street lessons? What was the experience like? What were some of your takeaways or the highlights or the memories or the travel lessons that you learned? Oh, my God. I mean, we had to exchange our money. I learned that everything is up for negotiation because when you go to the markets and stuff, you sit and negotiate prices. I learned how fortunate we were in the United States because even like my host family had a nice apartment, but they did have a generator. And so my showers, the water would only be hot for like five minutes. And I like my water steamy hot. And like that didn't happen over there. So I started to learn not to take things for granted. So I had one of my Dominican friends from Syracuse, whose family was in DR. He would invite me to go see his family. And so I went to go visit with them and they were a little less fortunate. And so their home was made out of like cinder blocks and it wasn't finished. And a lot of the roads were like mud roads and they used like well water and didn't have running water. So I had to take like the bucket showers and the lights would just go off whenever with no notice. And so I went to visit them a couple of times and I would say that experience like has never left me. And it just made me realize, you know, how some people in the world live. And it made me, I guess, super grateful. I mean, I look at my experience here in the United States and I, and I think this is something, this is why I encourage other African-Americans to travel because yes, we do have issues here in the United States, but in some respects, we are very fortunate. And I think it's just good to have that perspective. And then I had to learn how to hitchhike. So... <laughs> That was crazy. I used to volunteer in this mountainous town outside of Santiago de los Caballeros. And Santiago is north of the capital. And that's where I lived. And so I would go to this like town in the mountains, like an hour outside of the city. And after five o'clock, there's no more public van, the guagua. And so you have to hitchhike to get home. And so I would have to do that, or at least to get off the mountain, and then I could get one of the public cars. But just their transportation in general, uh, you could either use a taxi, which back then was like 100 pesos, or you could use a public car, which was like seven. And so being 19, I didn't have a big pot of money. I'm going for the public cars. 
And so <laughs> they were called the conchos. And so they have all these different routes and you put your thumb out and you pack in there. These are like 1990s Corollas with like seven people. It was the driver and two in the front and then four in the back. And you packed in there with these Dominicans and I just sat there and I was quiet. I'm a person that's really good with directions. I knew the route, so I just was quiet. Like, okay, I know where I'm at. Let me out. <laughs> parre, parre. I, you know, stop. But that's how I used to ride and get around. But now you look at things like, I used to look at that, like, why do they do this? But now we have Uber share rides. So it's like, in some respects, the Dominicans were way ahead of us. And I think that's what's cool about travel is you see how other people do things differently. And sometimes those could be like really good business ideas that you could bring back to the States if you're really paying attention. So that was your first trip out of the United States. What would you say was sort of the overall impact from that trip that inspired you to want to travel more? What was it about that experience that made you then want to go travel and experience other countries, would you say? And I guess I should correct that because my mom will listen to this. We did go to Toronto. <laughs> but that's it. So, uh, But I would say, I mean, the experience was just amazing because every day was a learning experience. I learned something every day and I just liked how much I grew and how much I was learning. And more importantly, California taught me that I want to be fluent in Spanish. And that's what I was majoring in. And I knew I would go to the Mexican restaurants when I was stateside. And I still didn't know what they were saying. So that was upsetting. And I was getting A's in school. So I knew that I needed to be immersed in the environment in order to become fluent. And so when I came back from the Dominican Republic, I still didn't quite feel that I was fluent. I thought I might lose the language. And so I wanted to go live abroad again. And what was your next move? Where did you go next? My senior year of college, I applied for the Fulbright program. Ironically, I had never heard of the Fulbright program, but my host sister in the Dominican Republic was applying for Fulbright to come to the United States. That was the first time I heard about the program. And then like the honors department had mentioned it at school. And so I wanted to go somewhere where there was a large Afro population and somewhere in Latin America. And so I was choosing between Uruguay, Venezuela and Colombia because I wanted somewhere different from Dominican Republic. And Uruguay just seemed like, I don't know, their black population wasn't as big. It wasn't as much about it. And then, so I was choosing between Venezuela and Colombia, but I figured Venezuela didn't have as good of a relationship with the United States government. And if something went down, they may not be able to get me out of there. And I knew that Colombia had a really good relationship with the United States government. Venezuela has a huge black population, but I knew that Colombia had a really large one. And my friend that was in the Dominican Republic, one of my American friends went to Colombia and he was like, yo, Steph. Man, you thought DR was fun. You got to check out Colombia. I'm having the time of my life down here. So he's like, you got to check this out. They got a lot of black people here. So I said, okay, that's where I'm going. So <laughs> I applied for the Fulbright and I ended up in Colombia. That's amazing. Can you talk about where in Colombia you were and where in Colombia you traveled? And also, how was that experience for you overall? So if Dominican Republic was wild, so was Colombia. <laughs> but I wanted to live in Cali. That's where I applied to live. But right before I was to come, a dean was like killed on campus. And so they switched up my program and told me that I would be living in Bogota, which if I'm studying afro Colombians, that makes it a lot harder. <laughs> There was a good population of them there, but it wasn't like the Mecca. So it was what it was. I got switched to Bogota. What was it like? What were some of the highlights of your experience in Colombia? I would say I enjoyed traveling to all the cities. Like I got to go to Cartagena, Medellin, Cali. I even went to Quibdo, which is like the main city in Choco, which is probably the blackest state in Colombia where a lot of the black population lives. I went to San Andres, Valle Dupar, Santa Marta, 
Yeah, all of those cities. So I really enjoyed traveling from Bogota. I enjoyed the nightlife there too. <laughs> I'm a big salsa dancer. So I mean, oh my God, the salsa dancing was incredible, especially in Bogota. One of the other Americans that was there with me, we used to go salsa dancing and he was really good. And we would go to the club and I tell you, one night we went and we was dancing and the Colombians was clapping when we was finished. And that that was an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of my fondest memories. But oh my God, I love the dancing, the salsa and the Guardian thing. <laughs> it was good stuff. We had so much fun. But I will say... It's one thing to visit there and then to live there. We were there in 2010. There wasn't a lot of tourists there, not a lot of American tourists. So we did always have to worry about our safety. I don't know if we had to, but that's what the State Department told us to do. So it was an adjustment. I didn't travel in taxis. I hardly ever traveled in them alone and I didn't at night. So like having to be escorted at night was different. But fortunately, the American friend that I told you about, he lived not too far away. So pretty much when I would go out at night, he would go with me and we'd go with our other friends and he would make sure I got home safely. We went to Carnival. I really enjoyed Carnival in Barranquilla. It was definitely something to see. They Again, they had parties at night (laughs) and they had their huge parade, which was like all day long. The only thing I will say about their carnival, I thought that they put a lot of work into it. I really enjoy seeing all the different dance groups and that type of thing. It looked like they had spent months practicing for this. But I didn't like, they have these boys and they dress in blackface and they're called like Son de Negro. But if you Google it, I really did not like this. And there's some of the performers and they're all in blackface and they run around and they go like, they kind of like, act crazy savage like and so i asked the colombians i said what is that why are they in blackface and they're like oh they're representing our african roots so that was very disturbing and i wrote about that in the book but that's what they do and i think that's what you learn about different countries is that just like united states we have negative things about our culture as well but You know, there are some things you'll like about a country and then there are other things that you can't stand. And Dominican Republic also has its issues as well. I felt like it was racial profiling and definitely like they're very picky on letting people in the club. I had a friend, they told her she was African-American. Her hair was like really long and she would just blow dry it. So it was kind of like a frizzy straight. And it was out to here. She had a lot of hair. And they told her she can't come into the club unless she puts her hair on a ponytail. Or sometimes they'll, they told me and actually one of my Dominican American friends one night we went to the club and they're like, no, you can't enter. It's a private party. So those things would happen. There was an experience once when we were in Dominican Republic, like headed toward the Haitian border with my, there were like nine Americans in my group when we were in the Dominican Republic and we would travel around in a guagua or or a private van. And um, we would go to different destinations every weekend that our professor had set up. And so we were going to Dajabon, which is the border city with Haiti. And when you travel in Dominican Republic, they have like these checkpoints and they have like a cop sitting there. And so we had traveled all over the country and it was myself and another black girl in our group and everybody else was white and one Dominican American and they never asked for our passports or anything they would just look at the van and say pasa well this particular time one of my friends from Chicago she's African-American she was darker skin and she had like a really short fro she came with us and she was sitting in the front row and so they looked at our van and they were like like stop and then they asked her all these documents her passport her birth certificate and all these things so I guess to like prove that she wasn't Haitian and that bothered me because all these other times you know they had never asked for anything and it's just like any of us could have been there illegally so why is it that you only stop and ask what is someone who's a darker skin? I mean, I guess you're looking for Haitians, but if you're looking for people that are in the country illegally, you should be looking for everybody, not just, you know, Haitians or whatever. So a lot of people know there's a lot of issues with Dominican and Haitian relations. Like I even took a class on it while I was there. 
And so like, that was just, you know, an experience right in front of me of what we were learning in, in class. Well, I know you put a lot of these experiences into your book, Black Trekking. Can you talk a little bit about the book and why you decided to write it and what people can expect from the book? Yeah. So I wrote my memoir, travel memoir, which is called Black Trekking, My Journey Living in Latin America. And I wrote it because of experiences like those. I felt like it needed to be written down. It needed to be told. We weren't prepared when we moved abroad. Nobody sat down and told us, this is how you could be treated as a Black person when you live in the Dominican Republic. And a lot of the travel books that I used to read, they weren't written by Black people. They weren't even talking about any of it. And so I felt like it was important for the future generations to know, hey, this is what might happen when you're in Dominican Republic. It may or may not, but it, it was important for me to just share these stories. And so I have a whole chapter called Skin Tone Matters. And it talks about, depending on what color skin you have, how you might be treated. Because on the flip side, you know, if you are a white person in the Dominican Republic, especially white with blonde hair, you stand out like a sore thumb and you're a target because they think, oh, you must be from the United States or UK. And therefore, in their mind, not every Dominican, but in a lot of Dominicans' minds, you must be rich. And so you are a target for robbery. And so like a lot of our white colleagues had got robbed, like had things stolen. And so no one talks about that either. And so I just felt it was important to share some of these stories. But not only that, we found out that there is a community called Samana in the northern coast of the Dominican Republic that is actually inhabited by descendants of freed enslaved people from Philadelphia. They're actually from the AME Church. And they were not enslaved, they were freed, but it was in like the 1820s. And the Quakers didn't know what to do with them because they're like, well, you're kind of in the middle, you're black, but you're not enslaved. And what do we do with you? And so they were trying to send them back to Africa. And the Haitian president, Haiti was a part of Dominican Republic at that time. He reached out to them and was like, hey, I'll give you land if you come down here and show these folks how to deal with the farms and the land here. And so they took it and they got on boats and came to the northern part of the island, Hispaniola, and those descendants still live there today. And so I actually shot like a whole documentary on that for my honors project for college. And then I basically transcribed the documentary and it's a chapter in my book. So it's not just like racial profiling and, and like discrimination, but I also talk about rarely told Black history stories, Black cultural stories, stories about Black people from Colombia and the Dominican Republic. Yeah. You mentioned to me that you had the opportunity to interview some Afro-Colombians that were displaced during the Colombian conflict. I would love to hear what that experience was like for you and what you learned from those interviews. Yeah, so I interviewed one of the just who was displaced from Barbacoa, which is in the Nariño province. I didn't get to go there because the conflict was bad there. <laughs> so I met him in Bogota and he basically was kind of fearful to do the interview, but he told me what, you know, he was willing to share. And he said that he was a community leader in his town and basically like the armed groups were threatening him and came and said, you know, they would kill him. And so he said, I had to leave my family behind. I had to leave. And so he came to Bogota and when I was living there, there was a lot of people, indigenous and black people, black Colombians, and, you know, sometimes selling things on the street, just doing whatever they could and I learned that, you know, where they lived, they depended on subsistence farming. They depended on farming off of the land. They weren't used to having to go to work every day. And so they were just like dropped off in Bogota and forced to make a living. And it was difficult for them. Like, in, I remember in his home, it was just like bricks. He lived on the south side of Bogota. And, you know, most people know, like, you don't really go south of the central I mean, tourists don't typically go there. So 
he had like a spigot out of the wall for his sink, like not really a stove. And I think he had like a blanket that he was sleeping on. It was like very bare bones. And he was just telling me that like the government or had promised to give him some money to live off of, but the checks stopped coming. He said he would work for people and then they wouldn't pay him like construction work. And then like he'd do the job and they didn't pay him. And so he was just telling me that it was like, a real struggle just to find his way. And he was upset that he even had to, to do that. But that was mainly what he told me. He didn't really get into the conflicts that were going on back in his home. Yeah. I mean, Colombia has one of the highest number of internally displaced people of any country in the world. I mean, that conflict just yes. displaced an enormous amount of people. And I mean, it's remarkable, though, that you were able to, you know, have that kind of a candid conversation and have that whole interview. And that's wound up in the book as well, right? Yeah, that is in there. It was sad to see a lot of those people like really struggling. I remember You would, especially like some of the indigenous people, you would see like blank, they would set out like a, you know, a tarp and would be selling like shoes and just any and everything like sitting right outside the um, Transmillennial Station. It was just sad to see and, and to hear some of those stories because from what I was told, it's mostly like the black and indigenous people caught in the middle of the armed struggles and being forced to flee. And then they had the law that says that, you know, they're entitled to their land, but they weren't following the law. Like the armed groups were coming in there and removing them from their land and taking all the resources because on the Pacific coast where you see a lot of the indigenous and Afro populations, that's also where a lot of the resources are. Yeah. So you were able to eventually put all of these experiences together into your memoir, and that is now available for folks as of just recently, right? Just the last couple of years that came out? Yeah, I finished it in 2019. It took a while for me to finish it because I came back from Columbia and I started working as a reporter and, you know, as a young reporter, like trying to take care of myself. I didn't want to ruffle too many feathers. But I didn't want to water down my experiences either. So it took me a while to get to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm going to tell these stories. <laughs> and so I finally finished it in 2019. And um, it's available on my website, blacktrekking.com backslash book. Um, it's also on Amazon and Walmart, Target, Barnes & Noble. Their websites also sell it. But the best place is my website. (laughs) Yes. Well, we're definitely going to put a link in the show notes directly where folks can check out the book. And then is there a special deal discount for the Maverick Show listeners? Did you tell me if they come? Yes. If they buy it from my website and they put the code Black History in caps, then they get 20% off. Boom. There we go. So we're going to put uh, the discount code as well as the direct link in the show notes. So folks can just go to one place at the com, go to the show notes for this episode and grab that book. I also, Stephanie, have to ask you about your trip to Ghana in 2018, because I went to Ghana in 2019. I spent about a month in Accra. And it was just one of the most incredible experiences, travel experiences ever. Like I've been telling everybody about it for, you know, two years now. Uh, But I would love to hear your experience in Ghana and how that was for you and what your reflections were on it. Well, you and me both, because I love Ghana. I went as a solo trip and it was amazing. It was everything that I needed at that time. I had partnered with Ashanti African Tours. And so I had a driver and a tour guide take me all over for nine days. And so I was in Accra. I got some clothes made by a seamstress. Then we went to Kumasi and I went to the Ashanti Kingdom Palace. I went to Kejatia Market the market was fascinating. I was just so amazed by the women there because they had the babies on their backs. And I saw these women with these containers with melons, like five, six, seven of them carrying them on their heads. And I said, oh my God, I would never make it here as a woman. I just thought they were so amazing. 
and had so much strength. Yeah, I love the market. That's one of the largest markets in West Africa. I got some amazing paintings. I learned about kente cloth. I got to see how it was made. And I had no idea that each pattern has a different meaning. So I learned that. I got to see how Adinkra symbols like Sankofa, how that's made. We then went to Cape Coast. And on the way there, we stopped by Asen Manso, which is where the Africans that were going to be enslaved, that's where they took their last bath. That was powerful to walk barefoot down to the river where this all took place. And it's like this rushing water in this river and you just sit there it's like in the middle of the woods and you can just picture like what they were going through and then we went to the castles the slave castles um in cape coast and then in elmina and that was an experience for sure i had like a my own tour at cape coast Whew, yeah that was rough especially the dungeons to go down in there and i said why is the floor like brown? And they said, oh, that's the feces. It's still there hundreds of years later. And you just, you look and there's no windows, you know, like a really small window. And you just, your heart just sinks. And then you read like the museum there. You read everything. You get to hear it from the Ghanaian perspective of how could this happen? And so you read, this was all for money, money and greed, you know, people trading human beings and then making them work. But it was just like the whole triangle, you know, transatlantic slave trade. It was money. And you're just like, wow, what people will do for money, like enslaving other human beings. So, yeah, it just really kind of put it into perspective, I guess, about how nasty, like, business can be if you're not paying attention. Yeah, that was incredibly intense. I agree. And I sort of tell people just, you know, for folks that haven't been yet, just preparing them that it's really kind of like going to a Holocaust, like a, a Nazi death camp type yeah. level of intensity. Or I went to the killing fields in Cambodia where the Khmer Rouge genocide took place. It's that type of a thing, right? So you're going and you need to prepare for that level of of an emotional experience because it's going to rock you to your core when you go there because it's extremely intense. I'm still processing it. And, but I feel like as an African-American, like, you know, and I'm a journalist, so I needed to know, I needed to go. I needed to see it. I needed to hear it from their perspective. Like I needed to go. That was important for me. And so I witnessed it and I have pictures and what I took away from it, I just say, you know, wow, I come from some very strong people because my ancestors survived. You know, we are still here in 2021 in the United States. So they had to be incredibly strong to make it through the castle and then make it through the boat ride and then get to the United States and make it through slavery. It made me, in a sense, feel proud because I was like, wow, okay, they really endured a lot. Like that was just a lot. But on the flip side, in that same area, I did a naming ceremony. And that was fantastic. It's kind of like a coming home ceremony. So I went to this village near the castles. And it was fascinating because I had to go into a room, the chief's house, and they had to ask for permission to name me. And I got to witness that transaction and like, you can't talk to the chief. So you have to talk to a messenger and the messenger talks to the chief and then the messenger tells you what he said. So just watching how that whole interaction went down was fascinating to me. And they had like this huge dance performance. And then I went into the house. And then they did like the traditional naming ceremony that you would give your child eight days after they were born. And like we did all the different rituals. I put it on my YouTube, but it was really fascinating. So what they named me was Nana Aba Ahima. And so Nana means royalty. 
And Abba is because of the day I was born of the week. I believe it was because of a Thursday. And then Ahima was one of the women who founded the village. And I guess she was like really smart and prosperous. And her descendant was like 100 years old and she was there. And so they said, you're named after her. And so I was like, oh, well, that's nice. And so <laughs> that's the name that they gave me. But it's really fascinating because now I see Nana in front of people's names. And I know I'm like, oh, you're from Ghana. And that means that you're like somebody special from Ghana because <laughs> you're royalty. Your name is Nana. So, yeah. So that was fun. That's so awesome. And your blog, Black Trekking, focuses particularly on Black culture and heritage around the world and all of the different places that you go, including in the United States. And I want to ask if you can just share a little bit about what people can find when they come to your blog about domestic stuff in the U.S. and maybe you know, even from the perspective of, let's say, Black folks that don't live in the U.S. that want to visit the U.S. and experience Black culture and heritage in, you know, in terms of the African-American stuff here, what types of things can people find on your blog? Oh, yeah, they should definitely look at my blog. So one place I would recommend about Black heritage is to visit the Whitney Plantation outside of New Orleans. New Orleans in general has a lot of like Black culture, but definitely either get a rental car or do one of the tours to the Whitney Plantation because they really break it down about how horrible slavery was in the United States. They have a memorial and they have quotes from people who were actually enslaved and they say what they endured. They have memorials talking about the children that died. They have a museum with like newspaper clippings and they just really break it down really good. So I really think that's a good place to go. Of course, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in D.C. I talk about my visit there. Definitely schedule three days for that because that's intense. It, It explains the entire Black experience in the United States. I talk about Birmingham, the center of the civil rights movement. The Civil Rights Institute there is so informative. And then if you go down to Montgomery, they have the lynching memorial and another museum there I think is very powerful. Also Nashville, the Tennessee State Museum in Nashville has a really good exhibit about Tennessee and its role in like Jim Crow and the civil rights movement, because Tennessee also played a a critical role in that with the sit-ins and and that type of thing. And also the terror because the Ku Klux Klan was founded in Tennessee. So definitely check out my blog because that's one of my focuses that I'm really trying to focus on is Black culture and places that focus on our history and even Wherever I go, trying to implement some of the um, Black culture, include that in my blog post. Yeah, that's awesome. I think you do an amazing job with that. We're definitely going to link that up in the show notes so everybody can go and check it out. I know one of the primary missions of yours right now is to inspire more Black Americans to travel internationally or even live abroad. Can you talk about that and why you feel that's so important, as well as what you feel the primary impediments are and how to overcome those? I think it's just so important because I feel like it makes you more understanding of others, more knowledgeable about other cultures so that you're not just stuck believing generalizations and stereotypes. I believe once you go abroad, you really see how much we as human beings have in common. It's an incredible learning experience to go to these foreign countries, you know, speak the language. It gives you so much confidence in yourself that you can accomplish anything. So I just feel like it is a phenomenal experience. And not only that, like we live in a global society. So a lot of jobs, you have to deal with people who are different from you. And so if you have been to where they're from and you understand their culture, I feel like your relationship is going to be that much better. Like my sister works for a global conglomerate. Like they used to just send her to Germany or China at the drop of a dime. And if you've never been abroad, like that can be kind of traumatic for you. And now your livelihood is at stake. But if you are in college and you study abroad, then when you get your, you know, your job and they say, oh, we're going to send you to Germany for a month. No problem. I love traveling, you know. 
So I feel like it's important for you to travel and go outside of your comfort zone. I, that challenges you. I would say some of the impediments is, I mean, a lot of Black people don't have passports. A lot of Americans don't have passports. So number one, you know, get your passport. You never know when you, you might need to use it. And I think it's just like fear. And also a lot of Black people will say like, oh, you know, they may not treat me right. Oh, I'm scared of how they're going to treat me. And maybe because I'm a light-skinned Black person that I don't have as many negative experiences. But I mean, I've traveled with my husband. We were in Europe. We had no problems. I traveled to Japan. Yeah, we stood out like sore thumbs. No problem. The people were super polite. No problem. We went to Bora Bora. They treat us like kings and queens. So it's like, I wouldn't let that fear stop you. You may have problems some places and you can't just let one experience dictate how everything else is going to be. So I would say don't let that stop you. Awesome advice. But one of the other things that you and I have in common is that our world travels have made us increasingly minimalist over the years and increasingly inclined to prioritizing experiences and the creation of memories over material items. Can you talk a little bit about that journey for you and sort of where you are now with that? I mean, I was always like, if I got money, I was, I was going somewhere. I was taking a trip. Like I was buying flights since I could buy flights. Like since I was like 16, I never was like, oh, I'm going to take 500s and drop it on a, you can't get a Gucci bag for that, but whatever you can spend $500 on. I never was like that type of person. I was always like, oh, I got to take a trip. I mean, in college spring break, I was on a trip. I was not sitting here like, um, buying all these things. And so I would rather have these memories than buying all these material things because the memories are what keep me going. And I love looking at my pictures. I love reflecting on all of the wonderful and crazy and, and even the challenging things that I've been through. That's awesome. Well, I also have to ask you because you are a new mom and your son, Kyler, is absolutely adorable. People can see a picture of him on your blog. And I wanted to just ask you just in terms of your parenting philosophy and how, you know, post pandemic, let's talk, of course, you know, once everything is safe and let's just let's just call it back to normal. Right. Hypothetically speaking, once that is the case, how do you intend as a parent to integrate travel, including international travel, into Kyler's life as a parent? I believe it's critical. It's important. So we plan to take him on trips because I want him to be a global citizen. And I want him to judge people by how they treat him, not by how they look or different stereotypes. I want him to be knowledgeable about all the cultures. I just feel like it's important for his growth to travel all over the world. Like, you know, I want him to be in class and the teacher, you know, asked for the capital of, uh, I don't know, Singapore. And he can say what it is and talk about how he's been there. Like, I want that to be my child. So we were actually thinking about this. I want him to be bilingual. I don't know how I'm going to achieve that, but that's the goal of mine. So we've been thinking about, especially here in Florida, do we want to put him in a bilingual school. And not only that, like when you see my child, he's African American, but he looks mixed. And so I think it would be highly important that he learns Spanish because people might come at him in Spanish and I want him to snap right back in Spanish. <laughs> so he, he looks like a global citizen. He could be from a gazillion countries. And so I just think that it's important that he travels the world with us near and far. He won't go everywhere, but he won't be on every trip, but on a lot of them, hopefully. That's so awesome. I love that. Okay. With all of your travel experience up to this point and everything you've put into your blog and all of that, reflecting on all of it, what are your top tips for Black travelers, especially maybe Black folks that are at the earlier stage of their world travel journeys? I would say definitely do your research. And I think it's one thing if you're traveling for vacation and another if you're moving there. But if you're definitely moving there and living abroad, like reach out to people who have either been in your program who are Black 
beforehand or go to some of the expat groups on Facebook, but definitely like ask questions, connect with other black people. So you really know what you're getting into. And so it won't be a surprise because sometimes, I mean, as black people, whether we're in the United States or wherever, you might expect that there might be issues, but you want to know what those are beforehand. So you know if something is happening and you already have decided how you want to act, how you want to handle it. But when stuff hits you as a surprise, I think that's when there's issues. So I would definitely, my advice would be, you know, if you're traveling there, if you're moving there, like definitely do your research, you know, see what other Black people's experiences were. Facebook groups are awesome. And even as a female too, because I realized that in Colombia, like you want to know what it's like there for a woman, especially if you're doing like a solo trip alone, like how are women treated there? So that will be my advice is do your research. Awesome. All right. I want to ask you one more question and then we're going to move into the lightning round and wrap this up. At this point in your life, why do you continue traveling? What do you get out of it? What does travel mean to you? I love traveling. It's everything to me. I think I get the memories. I learn so much. And I think my experiences become a part of me. Travel changes you. Once you see things and you're introduced to some things, you never lose it. You never forget it. So that's why I do it, because I think it helps you evolve as a person. That's an awesome answer. All right, Stephanie, at this point, are you ready to move in to the lightning round? Yeah. Let's do it. The lightning round. All right, what is one book that has significantly influenced you over the years you'd most recommend people check out? I really like Michelle Obama's Becoming. (laughs) I love that book. I could relate to a lot of things that she said. That's awesome. What is one travel hack that you use that you can recommend to people? I would say if it's a special occasion, let the hotel know. We went on our anniversary to San Francisco and we told them and we got free breakfast for like our trip. So that's a little small travel hack that I use that works. That's awesome. All right. Who is one person that you've never met that's currently alive today that you would most like to have dinner with just an evening of conversation and dinner with you and that person? I would have to say the Obamas because like I've interviewed LeBron James, but I have not interviewed the Obamas. So yeah, that's one couple I'd love to interview. That's amazing. Okay. I have to, since you just mentioned that, I have to build on that and ask about your experience interviewing LeBron. How was that? And what did you learn from that interview and that experience interacting with him? Well, he only gave me five minutes. It was very quick. It was actually in Tampa for the National Association of Black Journalists Convention. I had asked him, this was before he left Cleveland and a book had come out and had mentioned about him using marijuana. So I had asked him about that. And maybe like two or three questions. I mean, I was so young. I was like 20. I was like so nervous. So I didn't have a chance to get like very deep with him because it was literally like, okay, sit down, ask your questions. Okay, that's it. Five minutes. Bye. So it was very quick, but I got my moment. And more importantly, it had always been a goal of mine. Like I grew up watching LeBron in Cleveland and it had always been a goal of mine that I was going to interview him and I achieved it, but it was a lot of hard work to get that interview. That's amazing. Well, your next goal is dinner with the Obama. So we'll see if you land that one. That'll be amazing. All right. <laughs> Knowing everything that you know now, if you could go back in time, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your 18-year-old self? As much as I love to travel, I do wish that I had started investing in the stock market and like in my 401k more in my 20s, but definitely like the stock market. Like if I would have put like my little money from my amusement park job into the stock market, like in Netflix, like I'd be rich by now. So that is, I think, run. I don't have many regrets, but that's one is that I should have got into the stock market in my 20s. Awesome. All right. Of all the places in the world that you have traveled so far, what are your top three favorite travel destinations you would most recommend people check out? Okay. Bora Bora, number one. Ghana, number two. I think they should go to uh, Tokyo. I really love Tokyo. Tokyo is amazing and Ghana is amazing. Now, I have not yet been to Bora Bora. So do you have tips on how people should do Bora Bora? 
we went for our honeymoon. I would definitely say it's a romantic place or like a place you want to get away. When COVID started, I was like, ooh, I wish we could get on a flight to Bora Bora and just like get away and just don't come back till this is all over. But we couldn't afford that. So if you want to get away from people or just take some time to yourself or like write a book, Bora Bora. Not much to do there except relax, but it's fabulous. That's amazing. If anybody's not familiar with Bora Bora, just do a Google image search and prepare to have your mind blown. Yes. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, that's definitely on my bucket list. And that now moves us to our final question, which is about your bucket list. What are the top three places in the world that you've never been that you'd most love to go? You've been to them. I want to go to Kenya, Zanzibar. And I guess, yeah, South Africa, that would be high on my list right now. Nice. Yeah, I have been to all three of those. So whenever you are ready to plan those trips, feel free to hit me up and I would be happy to give you some tips because those are all three super, super amazing places. All right, Stephanie, at this point, I want you to let folks know how they can find you, how they can follow you on social media, how they can read your amazing blog. How do you want people to come into your universe? And of course, how they can get your book. Yes, I would really appreciate if you go to blacktrekking.com, check out my blog. If you type book, search book, you can find my book on there. And also my Instagram, it is black trekking and then a downward slash. That's where you can find me on Instagram. If you're on Facebook, it's just black trekking. So that's where you can find me. Awesome. We are going to link all of that up in the show notes. Everything is going to be at one place. Just go to the maverickshow.com. Go to the show notes for this episode. We're going to have the direct link to Stephanie's book with the discount code so you can get your discount. We're going to have the link to her blog, all her social media handles. Everything we discussed in this episode will be in one place. Stephanie, this was amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I had so much fun talking about all of this. This was so awesome. All right. Good night, everybody. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you buy cash flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber. To get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals, schedule your free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash audiobook. Whether you want the latest best-selling novels or books on investing, business, or 